Oh my goodness. Janet, thank you. I didn't realize that um, my, uh, my microphone was off. What would I do without you guys? Um, oh my it, goodness. So let me, let me start again. And we're live. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova. And today uh, we'll be covering some topics that just kind of randomly came up. Um, it, it just happened while I was just uh, kind of surfing the internet, kind of looking. I have a profound interest in World War II history, especially the Pacific Theater. And I was just looking up uh, some things related to um, my dad. Uh, he didn't talk a, a lot about his war experiences and uh, just a few bits and pieces there. And I started looking it up and I started um, as, with all the hyperlinks and you're, you're, you're clicking to the interesting uh, episodes there and the interesting people. And it just led me to uh, the topic of writers and then I began to look into the stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And that just got me thinking. I said, you know, I don't know that his life is the most edifying, but I found it just very compelling. And I kept thinking about it. I said, there's something here I need to talk about. And it occurred to me there are two, um, there are two Christian love stories, tragic ones, uh, particularly uh, one I'm more familiar with uh, just because I've read read the book uh, by Sheldon Vonakin, Vanakin, who uh, uh, his wife uh, passed away. And uh, that, that was an incredible, it's still a very beautiful love story. I'll cover some of that. And so amazingly, it's, um, I didn't realize at the time when Sheldon Vonakin was corresponding with C.S. Lewis that uh, C.S. Lewis also underwent a love tragedy of his own. And um, so I said, this would be good material to, to, uh, to maybe share. And one reason I, I like to do these live streams, uh, it's kind of lonely here. Um, there's been um, a loved one who passed away recently, my dear mother, and uh, this house, it's a big house and it feels awfully empty. And I don't know what I do without the community to support me and you know, it's just a, uh, just seeing people there in the side chat has been very heartwarming. Uh, tomorrow, I'm, I may try to have a, an actual panel on where we can just talk a little bit um, about random things. So let me see if I can acknowledge people. I saw someone earlier, and I don't see him anymore. Um, so Janet... Greetings, and Andrew, and Cheryl. Great seeing you all, great seeing you all. And uh, thank you again, Janet. I, I might have gone through the whole, I might have gone through the whole talk without um, unmuting my mic. So it's a good thing that you all are here, and I'd like to thank all the other viewers. There is another gentleman who I saw earlier, and unfortunately, I think, oh, Patrick Alexander and then D. Mel Meliora. So greetings, greetings to you. And Honesty Angel was here earlier. So greetings, Honesty Angel. All right, so uh, apologies if I need, if I... Uh, if I um, if I miss any of you in in the listing, I usually I, I glimpse at the side chat, and sometimes um, when I rewatch the videos, I realize I, I really do even miss things that people have tagged me on. So um, thank you for your forbearance. Uh, if I if I miss some of your comments or questions that were directed specifically at me, and oh. Here, thank you, thank you so much. So, just a little bit of a 
total side note, as I was um, trying to put all this together, there's just so much material and sometimes trying to sift out the relevant from the irrelevant. I'll, I'm going to start maybe off on a, on a lighter note first before we get into the heavier stuff. Um, because I was looking up F. Scott Fitzgerald, a real tragic story. Uh, he he ended up, uh, his, his wife uh, lost her mind and uh, was put in an asylum. And then um, the last few years of his life, he he had a, um, he became an alcoholic. He was drinking 40 beers a day, according to Wikipedia. And, um, uh, but yet there was something I, I wanted to, there's something that he said. Now, I've, I've never actually read any of his books, but he's noted for several famous quotes um, among the, uh, among those who are, are deep into literature. And he pointed out, he said, there's something about literature. You begin to uh, see a reflection of yourself, your needs and your longings and the things you think about. And then when you hear a writer expressing it, you don't feel so alone. And I said, that kind of resonated with me. I apologize. I don't have the quote right here before me, but that resonates. And, um, um, and, and, and C.S. Lewis is a very interesting character because he kind of reflects um, my journey back to Christianity. I, I'd like to say that I was a Christian most of my life, but I nearly left 20 years ago. But I had a very skeptical mindset. Part of it was because I was an engineer and scientist in the aerospace and industry. And there were a lot of experiences in church, church culture that turned me off. Um, but there were beautiful people there. It was like a lot of things. There are some of the most wonderful people you meet in the congregation and some of the most awful people you meet. And um, unfortunately, I do remember some of the awful ones. And, um, and, and why someone like Lewis resonates with me is that um, if one is engaged in, in, intellectual thought, like say in a university, and you're getting these things thrown at you. And then you're watching, you're reading literature, you're watching movies, you're being exposed to the lifestyles of other people. And you begin to say, well, how can I, you know, how can I reconcile that with what I hear on Sunday morning? Because, um, you know, some of the things in the, in the world of the people that aren't Christians seem so appealing and sensible and some of the characters you meet seem more appealing than some of the pastors that scream at you from the pulpit. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, that was my experience. I'm not trying to say all pastors are bad, but I had some, I had some, some bad experiences with them. And I, you know, I, 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 I couldn't quite tie all the loose ends, you know, cause I'd, I'd read literature and it would just move me deeply. And I'm like, Lord, you know, this, this resonates with me and, and it's not written by Christians, what should I do with this? And C.S. Lewis comes from that background of having read a lot of, uh, he was a professor in, I, I believe, mid medieval literature, and I'm going to cover his um, bi wiki biography shortly. And the fact he could come from that background and then see that, um, that all of the beautiful things in literature that he was reading was pointing him to Jesus, I found that very, I found that extremely compelling. And, um, but on a, like I said, I'm gonna start on a lighter note. I was mentioning F. Scott Fitzgerald. And uh, this has nothing to do with anything. This is just kind of a little detour before I uh, get into the heavier stuff. Um, Cause I'm gonna talk about two tragic love stories. So I'm, just, I'm gonna start on a happy note. All right. so. Let me see, there is, uh, I found as I was Googling for a picture of, um, as I was Googling for a picture of F. Scott Fitzgerald, I ran into, um, it just happened to uh, land me on the page of Gretchen Craft Rubin, who ha happened to have the, the picture of F. Scott Fitzgerald and let me see if I, I can find it. I, I apologize. I, I don't have it quite handy. And then I'm going to read some scriptures after this. I feel it's always good to start on a good note with some scriptures. But let me see. Um, let's 
Uh, here it is. And, and like a lot of things with uh, cyberspace, you'll just run into uh, topics you that just come out of the blue, and I didn't expect this. So I'm just going to read a little bit. You know, we'll have a moment of literature because we've we've done we've done science to death, okay, on this channel. So um, I, I'm going to cover a uh, just. This is a totally. Um, Total detour, almost irrelevant, but I just thought it's cute. We'll, we'll be a little literate for, um, uh, for a moment here. So F. Scott Fitzgerald, famous writer. And um, that's a picture of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And Gretchen Rubin is talking, um, has a blog. Uh, she's like a uh, self-help expert or guru, and I'll cover a little bit about her. But anyway, she was quoting from F. Scott Fitzgerald. From F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby. Recovering himself in a, in a minute, he opened for us two hulking patent cabinets, which held his masked suits and dressing gowns and ties, and his shirts piled like bricks in stacks a dozen high. I've got a man in England who buys me clothes. He sends over a selection of things at the beginning of each season, spring and fall. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them one by one before us, shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel, which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many colored disarray. While we admired, while we admired he brought more and the soft rich heap mounted higher Shirts with stripes and scrolls and plaids and coral and apple green and lavender and faint orange and monograms of Indian blue. Suddenly, with a strained sound, Daisy bent her head into the shirts and began to cry stormily. They're such beautiful shirts, she sobbed, her voice muffled in the thick folds. It makes me sad because I've never seen such, such beautiful shirts before. And uh, Gretchen Rubin writes, as soon as I started writing about color, I looked up this passage from The Great Gatsby. It's one of my fa favorite passages about color. The question, of course, is why is Daisy crying? If you know any other beautiful passages describing color, please let me know. I, I could pursue this line of uh, thought more, but I'll just... Um, point out something about Gretchen, and I only found out about her today. Uh, it says she's an American author, blogger, and speaker, and um, she wrote a book on happiness. But um, yeah, happy the happiness project, uh, better than before, um, before the four tendencies. Oh, yeah, the happiness project is one of her books. And I'm going to, um, let me just leave it at that. And I'm going to, yeah, that's one of my chemistry lectures there. So um, I am going to be doing some more chemistry on my, oh, speaking of which, that's my other channel. I'll be doing chemistry stuff. So let me share this happiness thing. And it's a segue into the scripture reading. And then we'll get to uh, Lewis's uh, love story. So this happiness project was by Gretchen Rubin, <laughs> and I'm just going to highlight one of the uh, one of the negative comments. I just thought it was funny re reading one of the negative comments. Here it is, self-involved, egotistical drivel, a trite and pedantic book from a self-involved New York housewife. Within three chapters, I couldn't stand reading another word from this uptight, preachy, uninteresting, privileged, and condescending woman. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so let me tell you about uh, uh, Gretchen Rubin here. Um, she is, 
she is a, a Yale graduate, undergrad, and then got her law degree. She married into money. She, um, uh, she, her father-in-law is was the president of Goldman Sachs, which means she's probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, so, so she's she, she's attractive, very intelligent, very accomplished, and rich. And if she hasn't figured out how to be happy with all that, there's there's a problem. <laughs> I'm I'm just I'm not being that serious. But um, let me share. I you know I don't know if she's a Christian. Um, if her book on all of her self help books don't have anything to do with Christianity, that that doesn't bode well for her. So what does the Bible have to say about happiness? Well, the word blessed is uh, can also be translated as happy. And in some, I'd say about one out of 10 translations of the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, instead of saying blessed are those who mourn, it says happier are those who mourn. And um, uh, when I first, when I early when I be was on my way to becoming a Christian as a teenager, I think the the passages in the gospel used the word happy, and that always resonated with me. So, um, and I asked the pastor. He said, "Yeah, that's 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 that certainly is the is kind of the spirit of what blessed means. You are you you are uh, you're on your way to being happy. You are happy." And so let me just um, read the gospel passage because I, I feel uh, I want to honor the Lord on this channel by, by reading his word. Matthew chapter 5, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And he, when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Happy are, the, happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Happy are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. heaven. Happier are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And, and, and Jesus said, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And there is a parallel passage. So that was Sermon on the Mount. I will read Sermon on the Plain, what they call Sermon on the Plain, which isn't exactly the same as the Sermon on the Mount. And there's some important differences. <clears throat> Many people interpret happier they in, who mourn in Matthew as being mourning for your sin, although not to the exclusion of other sorts of mourning. Whereas I... Um, in the Sermon on the Plain, when Jesus said, happy are those who weep, that really does seem to echo kind of the grieving and the weeping. And um, uh, I've, I've seen some commentators say that, you know, that, that really is kind of just the personal sorrow and loss. And then there's that passage where Jesus says, your sorrow will be turned into joy. And the the Greek word for mourn in Matthew is different than the the Greek word weeping in the Sermon on the Plain. And, and, and so when Jesus is saying your weeping will be turned to joy or, or to laughter, it's using the same Greek word for, for, for the grieving. And so I think this passage also is a nice segue into the comment of these tragic love stories where... Um, it, you know, the, the, the theme of happier those who mourn, happier those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So <clears throat> this is the Sermon on the Plain from Luke chapter 6. 
And he lifted his eyes on his disciples and said, Happy are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Happy are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Happy are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Happy are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. So those are uh, the, uh, the scripture readings. So now let me cover a little bit about uh, C.S. Lewis. Tomorrow I may talk a little bit more about F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway. And um, I don't know, I you know, there's a side of me that really likes kind of the arts and sensitive stuff. Um, and then there's the other side that reads all this war history. I mean, almost every night I'll be combing through the archives of the famous battles in World War II and I'd be learning the names of the individual officers and characters involved. But then, you know, I'll have those moments where I'm, I'm just very fascinated by human emotion and kind of these very tender stories. And um, I was just very, I just had this feeling I wanted to talk about it today. So, um, and I, that'll probably be a little bit of the talk tomorrow. That's where I was headed with that. There's no way I could fit it all. So um, let me read a little bit about C.S. Lewis. And And I see Nicholas is here, greetings, and my name is Mud. Welcome and thank you for coming back. Um, I, was, I, I was a little worried when Emery and I did a five and a half part series on the R.H. Brady paper on natural selection. I said that might have been just too much and I was afraid we probably lost a few people uh, <laughs> during that process. So. I'll just, uh, I'm not actually that familiar with C.S. Lewis. I, I, ha uh, I haven't read a lot of his apologetics works. And um, uh, before I say more, uh, that may kind of sound shocking that I, I haven't read that much C.S. Lewis. The apologetic style that I am most familiar with would be one like, um, like, uh, J. Warner Wallace, kind of matter of fact, murder detective, forensic. That's kind of my temperament. Not the not the highbrow intellectual um, presuppositional apologetics and other kinds of argument that Lewis got into, but I think <clears throat> I think that's something I need to um, I need to invest time in because now that I uh, now that many years have passed since I first encountered Lewis, maybe my reading skills are better and I can understand what he's actually trying to say. So let me, let me just share this. So if I'm just, forgive me for just reading straight from Wikipedia, because some of this is just totally new to me too. Clive Staples Lewis, um, 29 November, 1898 to 20, uh, 22 November, 1963. was a British writer and lay theologian. He held academic positions in English literature at both Oxford University, Magdalen College, 1925 through 1954, and Cambridge University, Magdalene College, 1954 to 1963. He is best known for his works of fiction, especially the Screwtape Letters, the Chronicles of Narnia, and the Space Trilogy and for his non-fiction Christian apologetics, such as Mere Christianity, Miracles, and The Problem of Pain. Lewis and fellow novelist J.R. 
R. Tol Tolkien were close friends. They both served on the English faculty at Oxford University and were active in the informal Oxford literary group known as the Inklings. According to Lewis's 1955 memoir, Surprised by Joy, he was baptized in the Church of Ireland but fell away from his faith during adolescence. Lewis returned to Anglicanism at the age of 32 owing to the influence of Tolkien and other friends, and he became an, an ordinary layman of the Church of England. Lewis's faith profoundly affected his work, and his wartime radio broadcasts on the subject of Christianity brought him wide acclaim. And by the way, that's something, some of his recordings on the BBC radio during the war in World War II, uh, I've heard them and I think they'd be very compelling to, to share just as a, a, as a kind of a historical, for its historical value in, in the defense of the Christian faith. But going on, Lewis, more, Lewis wrote more than 30 books, which have been translated into more than 30 languages and have sold millions of copies. The books that make up the Chronicles of Narnia have sold the most and have been popularized on stage, TV, radio, and cinema. His philosophical writings are widely cited by Christian apologists from many denominations. I actually didn't know that um, it's Chronicles of Narnia that have sold the most. In 1956, Lewis married American writer jo da Joy Davidman. She died of cancer four years later at the age of 45. Lewis died on uh, 22nd November 1963 from kidney failure one week before his 65th birthday. In 2013, on the 50th anniversary of his death, Lewis is honored with a memorial in Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey. Um, let me, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there was, um, there were some impressive things about him. Uh, Lewis entered Oxford in 1970, I mean 1917, um, it said here, uh, on his 19th birthday, he arrived at the front line in the Somme Valley of France, where he experienced trench warfare for the first time. Wow. Um, after return, Lewis returned to Oxford he, uh, University, he received a first honor moderations, uh, just an illustrious career. So a um, little bit about his Christianity. Lewis was raised in a religious family that attended the Church of Ireland. He became an atheist at age 15, though he later described his young self as being paradoxically very angry with God for not existing and equally angry with him for creating a world. His early separation from Christianity began when he started to view his religion as a chore and a duty. Around this time, he, he also gained an interest in the occult as his studies expanded to include such topics. I didn't know that. Lewis quoted Lucretius as having one of the strongest arguments for atheism, um, which translated poetically as follows. Had God designed the world, it would not be a world so frail and faulty as we see. Yes, the, the problem of evil. Incredible. <clears throat> Lewis's interests in the works of George MacDonald was part of what turned him from atheism. This can be seen particularly well through a passage in Lewis's The Great Divorce, Chapter 9, when the semi-autobiographical main character meets MacDonald in heaven. I tried, trembling to tell this man all that his writings had done for me. I tried to tell how a certain frosty afternoon at Leatherhead Station when I first bought a copy of fantasies, being then about 16 years old, had been to me what the first sight of Beatrice had been to Dante. Here begins the new life. I started to confess how long that life had delayed in the region of imagination merely, how slowly and reluctantly I had come to admit that his Christendom had more than an accidental connection with it, how hard I had tried not to see the true name 
uh, the quality which first met me in his books is holiness. I I'm sorry, this... Um, that was pretty thick for me. Um, I didn't... I don't think I understood half of what was said. So uh, if you guys understand it, that's great. And that's probably one reason I had some difficulty getting through mere Christianity. He eventually returned to Christianity, having been influenced by arguments with his Oxford colleague and Christian friend J.R.R. R. Tolkien, whom, who seems to have, uh, whom he seems to have met for the first time on 11th May, 1926, 26, in the book *The Everlasting Man* by G.K. Chesterton. Lewis vigorously resisted conversion, noting that he was brought into Christianity like a prodigal, kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape. He described his last struggle in surprise by joy. You must picture me alone in that room in Magdalen College, Oxford, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet, that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. After, after, um, his conversion to theism in 1929, Lewis converted to Christianity in 1931, following a long, following a long discussion during a late night walk along Addison Walk with his close friends, Tolkien and Hugo Dyson. He records making a specific commitment to Christian belief while on his way to the zoo with his brother. He became a member of the Church of England, somewhat to the disappointment of Tolkien, who had hoped that he would join the Catholic Church. Okay, so I'm going to skip now to um, the more accurate, at least the Wikipedia version of um, his, his relation to Joy Davidman. In later life, Lewis corresponded with Joy Davidman Gersh Gresham, an American writer of Jewish background, a former communist, a co and a convert from atheism to Christianity. She was separated from her alcoholic and abusive husband, novelist William L. Gresham, and came to England with her two sons, David and Douglas. <clears throat> Lewis at first regarded her as an, as an agreeable intellectual companion and personal friend, and it was on this level that he agreed to enter into a civil marriage contract with her so that she, continue, she could continue to live in the UK. Okay. <laughs> The civil marriage took place at the register office, 42 Giles, uh, St. Giles, Oxford, on 23rd April, 1956. Lewis's brother Warren wrote, for Jack, the attraction was at first undoubtedly, undoubtedly intellectual. Joy was the only woman whom he had met who had a brain which matched his own suppleness in width of interest and in analytical grasp, and above all in humor and a sense of fun. After complaining of a painful hip, she was diagnosed with terminal bone cancer and the relationship developed to the point they sought a Christian marriage. Since she was divorced, this was not straightforward in the Church of England at the time, but a friend, the Reverend Peter Bide, performed the ceremony at her bed in the, Christophel, Christ, in the Churchill Hospital on 21 March, 1957. Grisham's cancer soon went into remission, and the couple lived together as a family with Warren Lewis until 1960, when her cancer recurred and she died on 13 July. Earlier that year, the couple took a brief holiday in Greece and the Aegean. Lewis is fond of walking, but not of travel, and this marked his only crossing of the English Channel after 1918. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, describes his experience of bereavement in such a raw and personal fashion that he originally released it under the pseudonym N.W. Clerk to keep readers from associating the book with him. Ironically, many friends recommended the book to Lewis as a method for dealing with his own grief. 
after Lewis's death, his authorship was made public by Fabers with the permission of the executors. <clears throat> Lewis continued to raise Grecian's two sons after her death. Douglas Grecian is a Christian like Lewis and his mother, while David Grecian turned to his mother's ancestral faith, becoming our Orthodox Jewish in his beliefs. Now, I'm, I'm just going to pause a little bit. I'm going to look through the side chat because, oh boy, we uh, the side chat exploded. Oh, the abolition of man. Uh, that's Cheryl. Wow. Uh, I believe that's one of Dr. Sandy Pigeon's favorites. And Sandy, if you're listening, um, I, I keep remembering your quote uh, at your signature, something about the chests of men or something. And anyway, which is from the abolition of man. Um, okay. His collected essays on Audible or, or Steel were well worth the listen. My college thesis was on George MacDonald, probably my favorite author, lovely writer. Wow. Wow. Someone's really scholarly here. I've never even, you know, I'm not familiar with that at all. <clears throat> G.K. Chesterton's works are really good as well. The object of opening the mind as of opening the mouth is to shut it again on something solid. Otherwise, it is more akin to a sewer taking in all things equally. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so when someone accuses you of not having an open mind, uh, use that quote. What a great loss to think of all the elderly who pass on without anyone interested in listening to their life stories or what they have learned in their lifetime. The mind, the mind of man, of uh, the mind of the many is not the mind of God. Ah, yes, this, there it is. Men without chests. Um. Sandy Pigeon, all his emails to me have that <laughs> bit without chests. I don't have the full quote. Um, all right. So, oh, here it is. You can find C.S. Lewis wartime radio broadcast for free on archive.org. Thank you, Andrew Kaufman. So now I have... Let me see, I'm gonna, I think I have, see if I can find it. I, I have something I wanted to share. So let me see if I can find it in the bookmarks. If not, I'll have to Google it again. No, I'm gonna have to, I have to Google it. Let's see. Um, Oh, I lost it. Let me see if I could find the, if you'll give me a moment, I'm going to try to find it because I, let's see if I have it here on, on another. It, it, it was such a beautiful, um, I can't believe I lost it. I had, I had, I can't believe I lost it. I had a, a, a really beautiful, um, I 
had something I really wanted to read about Shadowlands and see if I could. Uh, apologies, I, I thought I had it queued up. Oh, I know what. I had a list. Hang on. I'm going to, I actually saved the list of links. I'm going to find it. Sorry. Um, I had a, um, I had a Joe Biden moment there and I just forgot what I was doing. So I, I'm going to try to recover here. Yes. Farewell to Shadowlands. I just wanted to, to share this with you guys. Um, the Wikipedia entry on Shadowlands is kind of weak. I, I felt the, um, the, the entry on um, C.S. Lewis's life was actually more comprehensive. Now, what someone had told me, and he's an English professor, uh, he told me that um, they interviewed uh, the adopted son and they asked him, what did he think? He said it, it had, you know, it had obviously some historical inaccuracy, such the fact that in the movie there's only one child. But he said the spirit of the movie was was accurate. So there were there were obviously some licenses taken uh, in the movie. So I'm gonna um, <laughs> you won't recover from a Joe Biden moment. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. So let me uh, read this. I, I found this to be a um, a very nice commentary on Shadowlands. And this is from a blog, and um, uh, the theme is Reflections on the Love that Changes Everything. Farewell to Shadowlands is the title of the last chapter of the book, The Last Battle, um, the last book in the Chronicles, in the Chronicles of Narnia series. On the last page, C.S. Lewis writes, there was, a real, there was a real railway accident, said Aslan softly. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it, in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is morning. And he spoke no longer, and as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that had, that began to happen after uh, that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can mostly truly say that they, they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. C.S. Lewis, The Last Battle. Chronicles of Narnia is a work of fiction, but there is a pa parallel in our lives. In the last book of the Bible is a passage that reads, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. <clears throat> I believe that God has done something special through Jesus Christ. In his life, death, and rising from the grave, Jesus has put in place a new reality. Now there is more to life than what we see around us in this world. Our life in this world is only the beginning of an everlasting life with a God who is always with us, who always loves us, who carries our burdens and provides for our needs. As one of his people in this world, we get to play a part in God's plan in making all things new. We get to share his message 
of life and hope and forgiveness and peace with others. We get to roll up our sleeves and work to make this world a better place. We share God's concern for all his creation, the people and the planet. And one day we get to begin chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, there was, I don't know if it was in here. Okay. I think there was a comment somewhere else. Um, I have, um, I, I don't know where I saw this, but... Um, there was commentary on the movie Shadowlands, and they said that the the producers, directors of the film, wanted to de-emphasize the remission of um, Joy De Davidman, um, his wife, when they prayed after they had the Christian ceremony. But in Lewis's um, other writings, he indicated he believed that that was a real miracle, an answer to prayer that she went into brief remission after they had that ceremony and uh, they, they had they had three th three lovely years together and that was you know they they wanted to de-emphasize that in the movie but that was very personal to cs lewis so um now in in the um wikipedia article on um in the Wikipedia article on C.S. Lewis, it mentions Sheldon Vonnegut. And so I'm going to uh, uh, finish the stream by reading Sheldon Vonnegut, a, a little bit about him, because it's a parallel story in some respects. Uh, it's different, um, but it has an interesting twist. The reason um, this book uh, by Vonnegut is close to me uh, it, it does have letters from C.S. Lewis in it. And, and you could see kind of the interaction there um, between C.S. Lewis and um, Sheldon Vanekin. And it was also a book that um, when I was relatively new to Christianity, uh, I became a Christian in high school. And when I went off to college, that was a book that someone was reading and I was just fascinated by it. I mean, fascinated by the story. And uh, later I did get the book and started reading through it because I'm a sucker for romance novels. I know that's funny for a guy that also likes to read war history, but I really am, um, uh, uh, you know, it, if they're good romance stories. But this one was a true story and I found it compelling. And also because it was, um, it, 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 it half the book was kind of the pagan love story and you can see it become a Christian love story. And so um, it's, sometimes I get the impression that some of these, um, um, these books on Christian marriage and all, it's just like, it tends to sound a little preachy. And this was just kind of hitting, uh, this one was very real. It was, um, it just hits you in the gut. <clears throat> So I'll read a little bit about this. I'll read an essay uh, that describes most of the book and um, especially the pagan romance. It was very interesting. And I'm gonna skip just some parts Vonnegut's, Vonnegut's A Severe Mercy is a book written about the collision of affliction and faith, which is another way of saying it's a book about the difference between how we imagine a thing might happen and how it actually goes <clears throat> and what role God plays in the difference. It's part love story, part adventure tale, part tragedy, 
in part theological treatise on suffering. I was introduced to a severe to a severe mercy in college when one of my psychology professors assigned it for our, our unit on death and dying. When I first read it, I didn't know what questions I should bring to a story like this. I hadn't seen a lot of sorrow yet, but I remember the way Vonnegut's story whispered on every page. There is more going on here than you see, than you can see. Pay attention. <clears throat> By the way, since I, I do like pictures, um, I'll show a picture of um, Vonnegut and his wife. Couple. Oh. Sorry for the delay. So it's not the best photo. I've had I, I have I have better photos. I've seen better photos. So so there's the here's another one the book cover. So that's the couple. So anyway, <clears throat> when Sheldon Van Vanakin Van met Jean Davis Davy, it didn't take long for them to fall in love. But theirs was no ordinary love. They would not let it be. Their love would be one the gods would look upon and wonder at the beauty of it. They regarded themselves as pagans, but it was high paganism. We worshiped the spirits of the earth and the sky. We adored the mysteries of beauty and love. Anne and Davy believed human love was the highest glory anyone could obtain. So they set out to make theirs as intimate as possible. They would share everything, the books they read, the places they went, the opinions they held. That way we shall create a thousand strands, great and small, that will link us together. Then we shall be so close that it would be impossible, unthinkable for either of us to suppose that we could ever recreate such closeness with anyone else. They called this their shining barrier, a shield to protect their love from all intruders. After getting married, they moved to Oxford, where they became more open to Christianity, to the where they became more open to the Christianity they had once presumed belonged to the simple-minded. This change came as they developed friendships with thoughtful Christian people, including C.S. Lewis. Throughout this book, Vanakin includes many letters he and Lewis exchanged. Soon it was no longer Van and Davy's friends drawing them deeper into Christianity, but Christ himself. They came to faith and soon discovered Christianity was not compatible with the exclusivity they had promised to each other as young agnostics. They would have, they would each have to have a relationship with Jesus that was their own, and this would affect every facet of their lives. As Vanakin put it, it is not possible to be incidentally a Christian. The fact of Christianity must be overwhelmingly first or nothing. Christ had breached their shining barrier. Davy's faith came easier than Van's, and he began to resent her conversion. I did not, I thought, resent her being a Christian. I resented her acting like one, <laughs> going to church without me, practically unfaithfulness. Though he couldn't articulate it at the time, he had become jealous of Jesus. At first, it was just Van and Davy. After coming to, to faith, it became them and God. But as Davy's faith matured, it seemed it was God God and her, with Van on the outside looking in. Van wanted to share Davy's faith, but he felt a certain measure of competition with its object. While Van wrestled with questions about his own faith and his feelings about Davy's, Davy contracted a virus that destroyed her liver. The virus led to a protracted illness, followed after some time by her death. For the rest of the book, uh, Van wrestles through what to make of the God who took Davy from him. Much of this wrestling is recorded in the letters between Vanakin and Lewis. 
Lewis wrote that he believed Vanneken's struggles had their root in the fact that he had made an idol of love and it was killing his faith. Lewis said something in this scenario would inevitably, Lewis said something in this scenario would inevitably have to die, the idol or the faith. The worst option, Lewis said, was for their faith to die while Van and Davy kept on living. You have been treated with a severe mercy, Lewis wrote. You've been brought to see that you are jealous of God. So from us, you have been led back to us and God. It remains to go on to God and us. She was further on than you, and she can help you more where she now is than she could have done on earth. You must go on. Do you imagine she herself can now have any greater care about you than this spiritual maternity of yours should be patiently suffered and joyfully delivered? If anything about this story sounds overly simplistic, blame me and my limited word count. There's nothing simple about the severe mercy this book unfolds. Vanaken, who has walked through the experience, surveys the land and raises his questions. Though the book is deeply theological, doctrinally orthodox, and humbly reverent, it offers no easy answers. No dismissive wave of the hand at affliction and death. Vonneken writes, the death so full of suffering for us both, suffering that still overwhelms my life, was yet a severe mercy. A mercy as severe as death. A severity as merciful as love. Nobody, nobody gets out clean in this life. We all suffer. We all lose people we love. We all wrestle with questions about the meaning of this life and the possibilities of the next. And we do more than raise our questions. We begin to form answers. The nihilist concludes there's no meaning to our suffering. The fatalist concludes it's, a, it's the result of an impersonal impersonal, unavoid, unavoidable providence. The East Eastern mystic denies its existence and tries to transcend the material world. But the Christians regard suffering as the result of a deep brokenness Christ has come to restore. We believe he's working all things together for the good of those who love him. And we believe our chief end is to glorify and enjoy, and enjoy him forever. These beliefs put suffering in the light of its eventual and permanent end. So we look upon our suffering, question it, and experience it as people whose hope is fixed on the finished work of Jesus Christ. A severe mercy has been on my shelf for more than half my life. It's one of those books, I'm sure you have them too, where when my eye falls on its spine, I feel a reverence for the weighty truths it contains. It helps us to remember and understand that the Christian faith doesn't center on a mercy without severity or a severity devoid of mercy, but on divine love that marries the two in the cross of Christ. This is our hope and we, and we dare not look away. Wow. Um, it's been, it's, it's been a very long time since I um, read that book. It's been almost four decades. Makes I don't know where I put it on my bookshelf, but I think I want to grab it. Um, I I, I want to grab it now. Um, it was actually it's easy. It's the English that it's written is easier for me to read, and there is because I love classical music. Um, maybe by tomorrow night I can find a, a copy that I could play. Their theme song was from one of Tchaikovsky's symphonies, and that resonated with me. Um, and I listened to it. I just, I just found it very compelling. And um, maybe I'll. Uh, it's really hard to top all the good stuff that, especially that last article. Um, the last two articles that were describing that heaven will be better and better with each chapter. Um, um, Jesus is, um, Jesus said, happy are those who mourn. And he told the apostles, your, your weeping will be turned to joy. 
And he said on Sermon on the Plain, you know, happier, happier are those who, who weep now. And uh, those, those sayings are for Christians only. Um, for those who don't know the Lord, there's no consolation. But it, it says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, this momentary light affliction is building for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. The um, uh, we are just in the early chapters, and to quote C.S. Lewis, we're not we're just even on the title page. These are momentary light afflictions; they will pass, and it will make meaningful the world uh, thereafter. So, I'd like to thank all of you who joined, and. Um, um, tomorrow night god willing we'll, we'll have we'll have another stream so i hope you enjoyed this topic take care and god bless you have a good night